Hey everybody, what's good, what's going on? JB here with another Cyber Insight video. Welcome back to my channel and thanks for making it your new spot for gaining cyber and network knowledge. Today we're gonna build upon a topic that I covered a few weeks ago in a video where I broke down 10 Cisco tips and tricks for new network engineers. Today we're gonna go a little bit further and cover another 10 topics. Uh, these are gonna be things such as, hey, how do you take a uh, traffic that's going through a device and make a copy of it and send it to a device someplace else on your network? Or, hey, how do you implement port security? There's also a few other uh, command line troubleshooting tips that I think will be useful for new network engineers, help them become a little bit more comfortable in their environments and a little bit more efficient. Before we get to that though, make sure you hit the like button down below. And also, if this is your first time on the channel, hit the subscription and notification bell so that way you don't miss out on any new content when I drop new videos. All right, let's get into it. The first tip I want to talk about is one that I've used quite a bit in certain environments, and that is the Enhanced Remote Span or ER Span service, which allows you to send a copy of traffic from your local switch across a network via a GRE tunnel to a host someplace else um, that allows you to capture and process that traffic. Say, for instance, if you were going to send it to an IDS or some other type of logging server. The really cool thing with this is that it helps you overcome the challenges that we've had in the past with just local span connections, which meant that the traffic you were going to copy and the device you're going to send it to had to be on the same physical switch. When you're setting this up, you can also uh, set up which traffic you want to capture based off of a particular interface or VLAN or subnet. So it's, it makes it pretty scalable to be able to capture different types of traffic. When we look at the configuration for it, the main thing is you need to create a monitor session, just like you would with a regular span connection, um, except you would then also make it a ER span source connection uh, or profile, I should say. You then specify your source that you want to have copied, which in this case is VLAN 5. You need a ER span ID that's unique, a origin IP address, which is going to be the IP address on the box that will be sending the GRE traffic, a destination IP address, which is where you're going to be sending it to. And then you want to make sure that you uh, type in no shut um, as you would for any monitor session to activate it. Tip number two deals with utilizing the include command whenever you're doing any troubleshooting with show commands. Um, in this case, I'm doing a show interface command and then I pipe that to include. And then I list out these uh, specific strings that I want to match on. So in this case, uh, what this does is it more efficiently shows me the lines uh, from the output of show interface that include uh, the strings ether, uh, desk for description, or error. Um, you can very easily take this and substitute other strings when troubleshooting with other show commands. So it's kind of just a, a easy way to be more efficient with the output from uh, the commands when you're attempting to troubleshoot. Tip number three involves uh, port channels. And this is something that I use quite a bit uh, in environments that I've worked in in the past. And what a port channel does is it allows you to combine uh, two or more physical interfaces together into one logical uh, link. And it does this utilizing uh, an open standard called LACP or Link Aggregation Control Protocol. Since it is an open standard, that means that you can use this between uh, multiple vendors. So it doesn't just have to be Cisco. You can do this with connecting multiple interfaces from uh, Linux devices or VMware or something like that. The limitation with a port channel is that it has to be connected to the same switch. Cisco does have a way to get around that though with their virtual port channel uh, technology, which allows you to connect uh, multiple physical connections off of one device to two different switches, as long as they have a virtual port channel configuration between them. If we look at the configuration over here, what we're doing is we're creating a ind individual port channel, so port channel 10. We're putting in the specifics for what we want the port channel to be. So in this case, a trunk with a certain native VLAN and allowed VLANs. 
And then underneath the uh, individual interfaces that are going to make up that port channel, we just go and do a channel group. And it's 10 since the uh, port channel is uh, port channel 10, and then mode active. Tip number four is useful when you start implementing more and more different types of services on Cisco network devices. Depending upon what you're trying to do, whether it's turning on NTP or different types of AAA technologies like TACAX or RADIUS or Syslog or SNMP or different types of routing, um, you need to tell the device which IP address it should source the packets for those services from. And if you don't do this, you could end up in a situation where the box is going to try to send it using a different IP. And you might have ACL somewhere uh, that are blocking that or the destination host that you're trying to send it to isn't expecting it from that particular IP address and might, might drop it or block it at that point. We have outputs here from both the Nexus switches and the regular uh, iOS switches. And you see from the different type of service that you're trying to enable, the configuration varies a little bit. Tip number five is really useful. And it's a way to uh, create different types of privilege levels within the device and associate different types of commands to those privilege levels. So in this instance, what I did was create a privilege level uh, seven and just assign the following uh, configurations statements that you could use with it. So, or different command statements. Uh, show startup config, show logging, and the show command. So whenever someone logs in and their account is associated with level seven, these are the only things that they can type on the box. There's three levels that aren't customizable, and that is level zero, level one, and level 15. Level zero really doesn't let you do too much, and level 15 is the normal level that you would expect to have um, with a admin account on that device. So in essence, is root on the uh, Cisco device. The remaining levels two through 14 are customizable, so you can set up a, a whole bunch of different types of configuration profiles depending upon the need that you have in your environment. Um, you also could do this on a AAA server, depending upon uh, what type of AAA server you have. Tip number six is very useful, and it shows you uh, what service ports are open on your device and what connections you have that are established on those uh, services. So if we look at the output over here, we see that we have port 22 open and have one session established, SNMP is open. We have an established syslog connection. We also have uh, TACAX and uh, another syslog. Tip number seven deals with a command that you will use quite a bit in switched environments. You're always going to have uh, trunk interfaces going everywhere. And this is a very good command to run when you're trying to troubleshoot why they might not be working. It's going to show you things uh, such as which interfaces are trunk interfaces, the native VLANs associated with them, uh, the VLANs that are allowed over them, and a few other uh, spanning tree type of information that is useful as well. Um, to me, the most useful thing out of the show interface trunk command is looking to see if you have any error disabled VLANs on the trunks. Um, if you're expecting traffic to be able to go across the trunk and uh, there's not an issue with a native VLAN, sometimes it will be that the VLAN itself is error disabled. And this is a pretty easy way to come to that realization pretty quickly. Tip number eight is one of my favorites. I highly recommend that folks implement this in their environments. Uh, it's a really good protective mechanism. Um, and that is port security. And what port security does, it allows you to restrict um, specific MAC addresses to particular physical interfaces. Uh, there's a few different options that you can do with this. If you actually know the MAC address of the hosts that you're going to have uh, connected to the physical interface, you can hard set those. What most people do, though, is they implement something called sticky MAC. 
And what Sticky Mac does is it will learn the first MAC address that connects over that interface and then write that MAC address into the configuration of the device. You can also specify how many different MAC addresses that you want allowed in over interface. The default number is one, but there are scenarios where you might want to have multiple MAC addresses, such as if you have a phone that's daisy chained uh, through a PC, or if you have a uh, server that has multiple sub interfaces going over a, a physical connection. Whenever an unapproved MAC address tries to connect over the interface, that is a violation. And depending upon your configuration, it will do a few different things. The default is to shut the interface down automatically. However, if you are in an environment where you are concerned about that possibly causing some type of negative operational impact, you can configure it to do the restrict mode, which will allow the original uh, allowed MAC address to continue to send traffic if it's plugged back in, but just block the unapproved MAC addresses. In both of these scenarios, it makes a lot of sense to have some type of logging enabled so that this can go back to some type of SIM or other management tool to let your network administrators or security admins know that there's been some type of port security violation. Tip number nine deals with the no IP domain lookup command. In most environments, your network devices aren't going to be providing a DNS resolution. So it just makes sense to go ahead and turn this off um, for best practices. An additional benefit of implementing this configuration is that it ensures that mistyped commands don't end up taking up extra time due to the device attempting to resolve what it thinks is a domain, but in reality was just a fat fingered command. The last tip builds on the port security configuration that we just went over. And the show port security command allows you to see which interfaces are configured for port security. The type of con security violation configuration it has, so whether or not it's going to be a shutdown or restrict. If any violations have occurred and the MAC address that's associated with each of those interfaces. This is going to be your first stop whenever you go to troubleshoot anything related to port security to see if anything is tripped and to kind of see the overall status on the device. So that wraps up Cisco tips and tricks for new network engineers part two. If you have any questions or comments, drop them down below. I'll get back to you. Also, if you have any ideas on any future topics you want me to cover in my next videos, drop those down below too. As always, hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. Go get after it, and we'll talk soon. All right, take care. Mm -hmm.